Hey, y'all. How's everyone doing? Good. Give me a thumbs up. Cool. Um, yeah, like Lauren said, my name's Diego and I'm from Florida. Um, born and raised in Florida. Um, started following Jesus when I was a junior in college. Um, any Greek lifers in the room? One? Cool. The rest are ashamed, as I was. <laughs> oh, man. It, that, that place needs Jesus. So anyway, had a pretty radical um, life transformation. I was a pike. Pi Kappa Alpha. Um, and then uh, after my residency in a worship ministry, I started applying places. And here I am in Milwaukee, freezing my butt off. So um, anyway, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not much of a sermon person. <laughs> um, I, um, I just really enjoy conversation. So this might be more of a conversational kind of a thing. Um, I might ask some questions that I would love if people have answers, they can chime in, but some of them are rhetorical. But anyway, um, I will make some kind of practical observations on this passage of the Lord's Prayer um, because I'll, I kind of tend to really hang out in the theory land, um, but I'll definitely give us some practical things on prayer. Um, so yeah, let's jump in. I'm going to pray for us. Is that cool? Great. Lord, we love you, and we know that you are here with us. Um, your word says that we're two or more are gathered, that you are here. So uh, we trust um, in your presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word that cuts directly to our hearts. Um, yeah, would you shape and mold us in this time? It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, I know a lot of times that when people share their screens on Zoom, it can kind of be impersonal. So I'll try not to always have my screen shared. But um, so my can you all see that? All right. Thumbs up. Great. Um, so the title of kind of what I'm going to talk about is Jesus uh, being a priest who practices what he prays. Um, I'm not going to lie, in the last two years, um, the Sermon on the Mount has completely flipped my faith upside down. Um, it's really moved me from being in a place of talking about Jesus um, and also um, growing in the skill of talking about the things that he talked about. And the Sermon on the Mount is his manifesto, his MO, right? Like this is... This is what his kingdom is about, and he is really unleashing it on these people. Um, so for me, as I study the Sermon on the Mount, it, context really matters to me. And forgive me if um, y'all have already heard this, but um, if, there's, if there's like one passage, I think, after 2020 that the world needs to hear, it's the Sermon on the Mount. I think if people really understood what Jesus was about, then we would live in a much better place, right? So for me, um, like I said, context is kind of everything for me. Um, I love digging into what people actually thought of Jesus um, at the time where this stuff was written. Um, so question for you. Do you know kind of what the audience is of the Sermon on the Mount? So Jesus is on this hill or a mountain. Who knows if it's actually a mountain or not, but do you know who he's talking to? Can you like chime in or give me a thumbs down if you don't know? Any ideas? Thumbs up, thumbs down, nothing? Cool. Well, Maybe you're doing really good Zoom etiquette, so I guess I'll go into this. Um, so actually, um, let's read Matthew 4, um, verse 23 through 25. Does someone want to read that for us? Do you all have your Bibles? Volunteer? No? Man, lively crowd. 
All right, I'll read it. So Matthew 4, um, verses 23 through 25, kind of give context as to where um, God is going um, and who he's talking to. So it says this, verse 23, and he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. So for me, um, this picture kind of really um, captures kind of who's who Jesus is ministering to. Um, the, these are people that really need some help. These are the people in the margins of society, the oppressed people. Um, as I'm sure you've probably heard if you've been around the church, but um, those people who were sick and needed healing, the outlook on them was that if you hung around them for too long, that you would also get those things that they had, um, which is pretty uh, pretty mean, right? <laughs> like the it's so awkward, it's so um, brutal, it's so abusive. Um, and they also thought that because they had these sicknesses, that the God of the universe had um, cursed them, that had that God had purposely put this on their lives, and so. Um, here is God in the flesh in some podunk little den here. And there is people like literally like pushing to try to get to this man named Jesus so that he can liberate them from whatever um, circumstance they are in. So the specific audience, I'm going to point out a couple characteristics, and I want to see if you see any familiarity with who Jesus was as well. These people were Jewish, right? In these communities that Jesus grew up in, Jesus hadn't started his ministry until he was 32 or 30. It's crazy. Um, 30 years, he was just a normal man. Um, and so the Jewish people were a minority group. They the Romans kind of had this really bad view on them where they were just like some pompous people who were like, yeah, we're the chosen ones and you're not God's people, <laughs> you know? Uh, so they weren't very liked. Um, these people were literally poor and therefore spiritually poor. Um, obviously your human circumstances affect your spirit. They were literally physically sick, not just um, sick with what us Westerners now reading the Bible would be like, oh, they they were sick in spirit, like they had some disease called sin. You know, no, they were actually sick people, and they were under Roman oppression. And here comes this man, Jesus, born into all of these things. Jesus was born poor. Jesus was born a Jew. And he was born under the systematic oppression of Roman rule. This is pretty amazing to me. I, I know I'm kind of getting into like history and stuff like that, but it really elevates um, the story to a whole new level and appreciation that here in this podunk little den is God himself born into these three characteristics of humanity, a minority, poor in social class and under oppression of a government. It's pretty crazy, pretty crazy how good God would be to take on humanity like that. So why, um, and I guess for the sake of time, this is probably gonna be a rhetorical question, but why do you think it would matter to this audience that they had a relatable savior? You know, as I, as I look at and we read, you know, who these people were, like lepers, um, paralyzed people and stuff like that, like, and the way they were treated, 
I'm guessing this group was pretty traumatically abused. Like imagine always getting up in the morning and knowing that something is wrong with you and the whole world looks at you like you did this to yourself and you were just not favored in God's eyes. Like that's pretty brutal. Um, their trust levels were pretty low and this is exactly where God meets them. He takes on, like I said before, he takes on this form of humanity. So I'm going to fast forward through the Sermon on the Mount all the way to um, Matthew chapter 6. But um, what happens here in the Sermon on the Mount is um, these people, their whole lives, they have been told that they have and are nothing. And Jesus comes and tells them that you are mine and you have everything, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven right? And not only now um, do you have an identity in God's kingdom, but now I'm going to show you how to live as my people, as my representatives. Um, and those standards that he gives in the Sermon on the Mount are pretty crazy, right? <laughs> like you've heard it said, um, don't kill. But I tell you that even if you, you know, I think of this discussion question that we started with, like imagine all your thoughts in your head were um, able to be heard. Like we would all be guilty of murdering people pretty often, right? So that's my summary of the Sermon on the Mount. And then we get to the Lord's Prayer um, in Matthew chapter six. So I'm going to read this. Um, we're just going to do five through eight right now. So verse five says this, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases at the Gentile, as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask him. So we'll stop there for a second. Um, so again, probably a rhetorical question because you guys have the best Zoom etiquette I think I've ever seen in my life. Um, what is the first step in how to pray? I think my first answer um, were, is probably um, don't do this, but I'm really looking for the the like proactive, like go. He says, go to um, a secret place, close the door and pray, right? That's, that's pretty crazy um, that he says that in order to pray, you need to be in this private place. My translation to what Jesus is trying to say there is get comfy. Get comfy, get comfortable with praying that the place of comfortability with prayer starts in the private place. And I think the easy question here is what does your private prayer life look like? Because when you nurture and you curate the private place, your public prayer bears fruit. When I first started following Jesus, um, I was pretty terrified to pray in public. And I, I feel like there's a lot of things that I wish people would have told me about prayer. And specifically in regards to public prayer life. And so here's the most practical I'm going to get, <laughs> to be honest. Um, these are some practical steps to curate the private prayer space. Um, can y'all see these okay? Give me a thumbs up. I know it's really wordy. I'm breaking the rules of um, having too much stuff in your slides here. But um, so my first recommendation is to schedule it. That might seem super simple, but discipline 
and, and I, I heard that y'all are going to talk about spiritual disciplines. Fantastic. Um, spiritual disciplines are so important. They're the way that you set up yourself to be transformed by the spirit. When we step into discipline, we go away with distractions. Like I'm, I'm sure y'all hear this all the time, but we live probably the most distracted, um, least disciplined um, generation in the world ever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're constantly getting things that um, draw our attention. And so schedule it and be disciplined in making that time specifically about this. Put your phone away. This is your time to grow in your um, in your practice of prayer. Next is listen. And this is all about relationship. The reason I put that word there is, um, you know, there's that there's that imagery that God uses um, in in his relationship with the church of a marriage, right? Um, and for me, when I think of listening, I think of what marriage flourishes with one person talking the entire time, right? Like, the more I listen to my wife, the more I understand what my wife is saying. And even to the point when I listen, I realize what she's not saying, right? Prayer is not all about talking. <laughs> Please, it, the moment you can, um, I think Mother Teresa was asked one time, um, how is your prayer life so um, abundant and flourishing? And she says, I don't know, Half, like the majority of the time I just stare out a window. And if you don't get that, then you don't get prayer. And that, when I heard that, I was like, absolutely. Like that is true prayer. Like. We need to talk less. <laughs> Maybe some of us with this discussion question that we started with should have probably answered. Yeah, I should probably listen a little more, right? Um, next and practical steps is posture. Um, get on your knees and ask. As a worship leader, um, these Hebrew words for posture really matter to me because they're biblical. Um, they teach people how to worship. Prayer is worship. It's a way where you decide, I'm going to dedicate this time to God. That is worship, right? So one of the words for um, for worship, for praise, is yada, which is to extend your hand. And um, that is found in Psalm 138, as well as a couple other places. Um, but this specific posture of getting on your knees is called barak. Um, you can find it in Psalm 95, um, and it's this posture of complete um, reverence and complete acknowledgement of um, the power of God, that it, this is all his, right? I remember um, in college, I really wanted to wake up at 530 in the morning. I don't know why. I was just like, I need to wake up at 530 in the morning to be a better man. And I, I went to my lead pastor and I told him, I'm like, I need help. Like, I just can't do it. I'll just snooze and snooze and snooze. And he goes, well, how, how desperately do you want this? And I was like, pretty desperately. Like, I really feel like this would catapult like me and my efficiency and effectiveness and on all this stuff. And he was like, okay, well get on your knees and ask. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, if you really want it, get on your knees and ask God to help you. I think, I think if the church really wanted to grow in prayer, really wanted to grow in their practice of complete reliance on God, they would get on their knees more. They would get on their knees more. One of the most powerful things that I've ever experienced as somebody who has started following Jesus at 21, I've only been in contemporary context churches. But one time in seminary, I had to go to a Catholic mass and watch um, a whole mass. And I was so moved by this one elderly lady who was basically being helped to her pew. And um, I don't know if you've ever been to mass, but when you when you go down the center aisle and you find the row that you want to sit in, they kneel towards the cross. And then they get up, they find their seat, and then they sit down. 
And she struggled so badly to get on a knee that I was so stirred for her faithfulness to really show reverence to God and saying, this is all about you and I am here to honor you. So next is, um, I'm going to kind of breeze through these next ones because I want to make sure I get to some good stuff, but um, your heart over your mind. Um, I fear that we've kind of created this equation for praying that our efforts in worshiping God or telling God his characteristics that God already knows about himself somehow like earns us prayer <laughs> favor or something like that. Like I'm sure y'all have heard. Um, and I do this all the time. Um, like we start telling God who he is for like five minutes straight. I'm like, if we look at the Lord's prayer, it goes pretty quick straight to this next point of petition, 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 the meat. Like God is not waiting for us to tell him who he is. Like make sure it's actually in your heart to tell God in that moment. If it's like, God, you are so merciful. And I feel that right now. I need your forgiveness for what I just did. Get to the meat. <laughs> like the, I contemplated putting get to the Arby's, but I didn't know if you guys watch TV enough to know that anyway. Um, next, um, these are some more um, kind of humility parts is give yourself the freedom to not have to like come up with prayers from the heart all the time. Like if you're leading something in the public place and you know you're going to be asked to pray, write it down. Like give yourself the freedom to create a liturgy. Um, I'm going to show you some books here in a second after this next point. Read other pre-written prayer books, Communion of the Saints. Communion of the Saints just means like to not build on what others have established before us is a waste. You know what I mean? Like there's been so many faithful followers of Jesus that created books of prayers. Go read them, <laughs> you know? Um, so um, here, let me show you a couple um, books that I read that have really like given me new language to use in prayers. Um, this guy is called, and if you want, um, a list of what I'm about to show you. I'm more than happy to send it to Joe or to Jake. Um, but this is two prayer books by a guy named Strand Coleman. He's a poet and he writes beautifully. And I am so stirred to pray the things that he writes. Um, it's Black History Month. So I thought I'd pull this guy out. Um, fun fact, this is Howard Thurman's book called The Inward Journey. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. always had this copy on him wherever he went, which is really, really interesting. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. got a lot of his ideas from Howard Thurman. Um, Reaching Out, great book on why it's important to be in unceasing prayer. Worship Source book. This is a worship leader's dream right here. So many um, liturgical prayers, so many um, ways to engage your congregation in praying with you. Then, of course, Andrew Peterson's Every Moment Holy. There's a liturgy and a prayer for anything from changing diapers to um, doing laundry. It's amazing, but every moment is holy. So anyway, that took longer than I thought. I get passionate. So let's read the Lord's Prayer. All right, so verse 9, chapter 6. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I find it really interesting that Jesus is telling his people how to pray and every single part of his prayer, he has lived out. And let me dissect that. Our father, first of all, the fact that we get to call, like Jesus is equating these people with his family and saying, no, you have the same father as I do. That's amazing. <laughs> right. Um, 
But Jesus is saying this personal relationship, Matthew 14, Jesus draws away from the crowds to spend time in solitude and prayer. Some of you extroverts, be more of an introvert, introvert sometime, you'll grow. <laughs> um, Hallow, Jesus, fun fact, always gave glory and honor to the Father. He never really wanted glory to himself, which is pretty crazy to think about how he honored the Father. It's such a beautiful thing. And the Father always glorified the Son. It's a beautiful thing. Um, your kingdom come. Jesus constantly reminds us, right, of his gospel. Yes, it was a personal salvation thing, but his gospel always equated with the, his kingdom. And when he would announce his kingdom, he would do it after he healed somebody, after he forgave somebody, after he redeemed something, after he spoke dignity into somebody's life. He was saying, this is what my kingdom looks like, and I'm going to bring it to a reality here on earth. Your will be done. Jesus is constantly submitting to the Father. Um, the moment that most comes to mind for me is Mark 14, where Jesus is on, um, he's in the garden and, you know, he's sweating blood. Like, that's insane to think about. But, um, and he says, let this cup pass from me. But if it's your will, God, I'll do it. That's him submitting to the Father. On earth as it is in heaven, God is on earth establishing his kingdom. So he does that to daily bread in uh, the Lord's Prayer. Is it literal or spiritual? Yes, is my answer to that. Um, he is that, remember, these people are poor. Like they were actually um, worried about having what they needed to eat for the day. It wasn't just a spiritual bread and they didn't have the Bible <laughs> in their hands, right? That was the printing press wasn't made yet. Um, Forgive us. That's the only part I can say that Jesus did not live into. He was perfect. He needs to be the spotless lamb, right? Forgive others. That is the essence of why he came to bring forgiveness to humanity. Temptation. Jesus withstood temptation 40 days in the wilderness before he went into um, his ministry. Um, we're currently in that season of Lent, remembering those 40 days before the cross. Deliverance deliver us from evil. Jesus is constantly leading people to life. Um, but I think what's really um, a good question, I think for us is, yes, on this side of the cross, we're like, yeah, the ultimate en enemy is sin, right? And Satan, but who was, who was this audience's true enemy or evil? Who, who did they want to be um, actually um, delivered from? And more practically, it was probably the oppressive system of um, the Romans. Fun question. Does Jesus mention eternal life in the Lord's Prayer? I find this question so fascinating because, I, I, and I'm not saying like, don't pray for heavenly th things in the future however i think what i'm trying to get at is that jesus honors in this prayer the human experience and not just eternity i think so many times when christians pray for other people they they're like lord we know that in the future <laughs> um we will be with you there will be no sorrow and that's wonderful i totally agree with you um like there is a very real reality of our future hope, right? But Jesus's kingdom was right now. He was establishing this social system of the last being first and the first being last. Like that was a whole economic system and it's for here and now, and it's for the poor and broken heart. Bread, that's for right now. That's for people's physical need right here, right now. Forgiveness. He anchors this whole passage in the idea of forgiveness. He says, if you don't forgive others, how do you expect me to forgive you? That's a pretty urgent ask, right? God is alive and active, and it's right now. And how does this impact the way you pray? So if I were to sum up kind of what I'm trying to get at here with giving you all this context about 
who God is talking to specifically. It's how do you pray as if God is alive and active right now? It's you honor God and you honor hum humanity because that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did in this Sermon on the Mount. So, um, sorry, I'm losing my place real quick. Um, so what I mean by honor, honor humanity is when, um, when the church asks people, hey, do you need prayer? Like there's something really specific that's going on. And we need to know as, God, as followers of Jesus, like why we're doing what we're doing when we're doing what we're doing. Like when we, when we say, um, I need prayer, there's a very real sense of us saying, I know that I matter and that Jesus honors humanity in my circumstance right now. And so I need help and I need you to pray because I know God cares about my human circumstances. When you intercede for somebody else and you pray for somebody else, you are saying your life matters and your circumstance matters, and your humanity matters. So I'm going to intercede for you on behalf of um, of your circumstances. And so, yeah, that's kind of my whole point is to honor God and um, to honor humanity. So um, I know I went a little bit over, um, but if y'all have any questions, I don't know if we have time for questions, but if y'all need to jump into your breakout groups, that's totally cool. Um, yeah, so I don't know who's taking it from here. <laughs>